Good afternoon. Yep, my name is Simon Campbell. I'm from here at Monash, senior researcher. Uh, today I'll be talking about, not about AGB stars, although I mentioned them once or twice, so it's a little bit off topic. Um, we're talking about a, a nice little project we've been working on for the last year or so, carbon deficient red giants. And I hope to convince you that we've discovered a population of merger products, which could be quite useful for studying how, how stars um, go through those common envelopes, like <clears throat> also was talking about, and how they end up. This has been in collaboration with a couple of people overseas, uh, Sanaina Mabin at Beijing, she's now a postdoc, and also Bharat Kumar in uh, India. Okay, so what are these carbon deficient red giants? Well, as the name suggests, they're red giants, they don't have much carbon in their atmospheres. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery where this carbon went, um, but one thing we do know is that they're very rare. Um, up till 2019, we only knew of 44 of these, and the first one discovered about 100 years ago. So there's not many. Uh, last year, our group <coughs> got, made use of uh, these big spectroscopic surveys and found another 100 uh, carbon deficient giants. Um, and we confirmed and we put a number on it. They're about 0.03% of all red giants. So these are very rare objects, even rarer than the lithium rich giants, which are quite popular. Um, so these are stars, red giants that live below the poverty line. So here I've got a plot of carbon on the vertical axis spread out through metallicity. Uh, each dot is a star. This is from, these are apogee red giants. And you can see pretty much all stars lie on this scaled solar line. Um, <clears throat> But here, the dashed line is the poverty line here. So this is our carbon deficient giants. And there's about 160 known so far. This is pretty much all of them. Um, the red ones are the ones we added to the sample. Um, so that's <clears throat> it's nice. We got a good sample. But even having that extra 100 stars didn't help us work out actually what they were. <laughs> and there's lots of theories. So when you, <clears throat> when you see lots of theories, then you realize we don't really know what's happening. Um, you can break up the theories into two sort of overarching scenarios, in situ scenarios where there's the stars do it to themselves. They have some sort of extra mixing, deep mixing to destroy that carbon through maybe the CNO cycle. Or external scenarios where you have um, some mass transferred, for example, from an AGB star, uh, <clears throat> or maybe even on the pre-main sequence, some people suggest or on the main sequence. But overall, we just, we didn't, we just, didn't manage to progress the field. And the main reason for that is because we we're just using the classic sort of way of working out what these stars are, you know, what mass they are, um, what phase of evolution. So we use these stellar tracks, as everyone does, and, and this is sort of the region where CDGs lie. And so that's very heavily degenerate in terms of what mass the star, star is or what phase of evolution. There's multiple phases of evolution under here. So what we want is to really nail down that phase of evolution and also their mass. Uh, and a key way to do that is to use astro seismology these days. This gives us mass and, and some information about interior structure, which can split, for example, the red giant branch stars from the core helium burning stars. Um, combine that with Gaia, very nice luminosities, and maybe we'll be able to say something. And so that's what we did. Now the best, the best seismic data is in the Kepler field. Um, Kepler looked at this patch in the sky, Kepler field of view for four years, took time series photometry for four years. So that's quite an amazing data set. And there's thousands upon thousands of red giants in there. So this is quite a nice sample to be used for seismology. Um, but it is a small field of view. Uh, we wanted to combine that with chemistry because we know they're carbon poor. We have to find carbon poor stars, we need carbon. So we cross match with Lamos and Apogee, for example. And then also, Gaia, this overarching sort of um, <clears throat> survey that gives us nice photometry and astrometry, and we can get really nice luminosities. Uh, so we're calling this the sort of stellar data sweet spot because we've got the seismic parameters and, and the uh, temperatures, log G, and a, a sort of swathe of abundances. So we can do a really well characterized uh, set of stars. So here's our, our Kepler field sample. So we have, as you can see, we can have main sequence here. We've got red giant branch in gray. And importantly, we've got the red clump here in red. And that comes from the seismic um, data. We're able to split the red giant branch and the red clump. So it's not a bad sample, 10,000 stars. Very well characterized. But as I said, these carbon deficient red giants are very rare. 
So we didn't expect to find many. And what we did find was 15. So these are Kepler field red carbon deficient red giants. And the first thing that popped out of us is that they're all red. So they're all red clump stars. They're all core helium burning. They have convective core helium burning cores. So this is a really important um, sort of um, <clears throat> characteristic and it allows us to rule out lots and lots of theories that were proposed in the past. <clears throat> so for example, because we're not seeing them down in the main sequence, we, we, so there's one we found on the red giant branch, but on the whole, there's nothing on the red giant branch and main sequence. And so they sort of just appear out of nowhere on the red clump. Now they're not, they haven't been polluted along here and they just sort of appear. So that's a really important clue for their formation mechanism. Okay. Um, so as I said, we have lots of abundances, probably about 30, um, but I'll just show a couple of the key ones here, carbon and nitrogen. So of course they're defined by being carbon poor. So carbon is, is low here. Um, but they're also very high in nitrogen. And the interesting thing is, when you add carbon and nitrogen together, you end up back at the scaled solar line. And so this is very reminiscent of the CNO cycle. So the CNO cycle burns hydrogen, and it uses the CNO isot isotopes as, um, just as catalysts. They get rearranged, but the number of CNO isotopes does not change. And so what happens is that carbon basically goes to nitrogen, and if you're higher temperature, then you might get oxygen also go to nitrogen. <clears throat> and, but these are cons the number is conserved, and so this is what you expect. You expect to end up sort of collapsing to the original composition, which is usually scaled solar. So that's an imp another important clue. Something we really didn't expect is in this plot of luminosity. And they seem to, well, they do, split into two groups. So we have these blue ones, which are, we call normal luminosity carbon deficient giants. So these have the classic red clump luminosity of about 50 old suns. Um, but there's also this group here, which are, we're, we're calling them overluminous CDGs. And so these are red clump stars, because we know from the seismology, <clears throat> um, but they have luminosities that are like a factor of two larger than your classic red clump. Not only that, as you can see here, after spreading it out with sodium, that luminosity correlates with chemistry. So there's some link here between the <clears throat> how bright the star is and sodium, for example. So that's another important clue, this luminosity. So just to summarize, and to show some more differences. So as I said, you can get from astrososmology, you get nice masses, evolutionary states. He's just reiterating, reiterating the luminosity point. Here I've just got a CMD temperature versus, this is linear in luminosity, so you can see this is sort of 50, 60 L suns. And these red ones, uh, overluminous red clump, carbon deficient giants, are about 100 to 150. So they're, they're really quite different. Uh, in terms of mass, um, uh, for <clears throat> they, they really stand out in, in terms of radius, actually. For, for the given mass, which we now know from astroseismology, there are outliers up here in radius. So they're not only bright, they're puffed up. Um, <clears throat> they're much larger than their, their counterparts. I forgot to mention that the grey dots in the background are a red clumps um, sort of control sample. So the bulk of them are in here, and then you have these outliers. Um, <clears throat> if we look at sort of the raw seismology over here, we have... Um, um, they're, they're outlying in the raw seismology as well. That's a, that's a good sanity check just to check that. Um, so they're all around just weird stars, these overluminous red giants, red clump stars. Okay, uh, so now we know their masses. We can do this trick with comparing them to our, our stellar track. So here's a two solar mass track, which is sort of typical for these overluminous red giants. Um, and this is where the red clump should be. So they spend sort of tens of millions of years here. And just to drive around the point, that's where our red clumps, our carbon deficient, overluminous red clump stars are. <laughs> so um, yeah, they're just weird. And so this suggests that they're, because they don't fit on a normal stellar, single stellar track, something strange has happened to them. They have deviant structures for some reason. Um, so our conclusion at the end of that <clears throat> paper was that they've most likely merged objects. And I didn't go through everything here, but um, these are the sort of main piece of evidence that point towards them being merged objects. First is that they're, as a sort of population, we don't have that many, but as a population, they're biased towards higher masses than your typical red clump stars. 
So that's what you'd accept, ex expect if you're merging stars together. The whole population should shift up in mass. Uh, also, the, as I said, they sort of just appear on the red clump, which is um, uh, doesn't come from standard ev evolution, but you can definitely get it from a, a merger. And here's sort of the merger scenario. The idea is that you have a red giant star accreting a helium white dwarf, and that helium white dwarf merges with the core of the red giant and basically boosts the mass of that helium core, and that should ignite helium, and then it should jump to the red clump phase. So I'll go from the red giant to the red clump. Um, and yeah, so, and that may, when you have a merger, that might give you non-standard cellar structure and also peculiar chemistry. It might come from that whole merger event. Uh, so this year I've been working on some modeling of this merger event just in 1D, so very simple. Uh, <clears throat> ignoring all the amazing hydrodynamics that also has been talking about this morning. Um, so the idea is that we have this red giant branch that has this little helium core. We want to merge that with the helium white dwarf, and so we end up with something with an oversized helium core that will ignite helium, hopefully. And then we evolve that forward for millions of years. <clears throat> um, so in practice, there's a few things, and this is sort of uh, guided by some earlier um, hydrodynamic simulations. Um, here, here's a sort of one picture where the, the white dwarf is accreted on top of that helium core of the red giant. Um, in practice, we're sort of assuming this is some sort of instantaneous merger. We know what the mass should be at the end, so we can fix that. So it's about two solar masses. Um, and so in practice, we just sort of merge those and then add an envelope as well and then run that forward and see what it looks like. Does it look like um, what we're seeing in these CDG um, overluminous red clump stars? So here's a temperature structure of one of our first attempt, <laughs> or first successful attempt rather, lots of other attempts that um, uh, didn't work for various reasons. So we can see the, the warm helium core, so that's that dark blue section in there. And then you can see the accreted helium white dwarf here around here in light blue. And then there's a the convective envelope. <clears throat> So we've got the temperature structure, and that, and that should lead to some weird, some weird um, structure and, and probably burning as well, which is what we want. Uh, so going back to this original plot showing the, the deviant um, parameters, so we have luminosity, uh, the merger model I'm going to put in green, and it turns out it is overluminous. This, this basic stellar structure turns out to be overluminous. So it looks like a duck. In terms of radius, it's also very large. Compared to compared to other um, red clump stars, and also the seismology um, uh, is deviant as well. So, because seismology is about pressure waves, sound waves, it also sounds like a duck. So, it looks like we've found a whole set of merger ducks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the caveat here is that it matches all that you know bulk stellar structure stuff, which is important, it was vital, but it's not carbon poor. This first model is not actually carbon poor. <laughs> so what is required to get carbon poorness? Well, basically one CNO cycle material, it looks like, even uh, higher temperatures, so we have sodium enhancements as well, so neon sodium cycle. So we know sort of a temperature that it should be burning at. Um, in the literature before it, people have suggested accretion and um, also dredging up towards the hydrogen shell, which should be depleted in carbon. But we've realized that that's not possible because you just, you, to deplete carbon that much, you have to um, add like a solar mass of material with zero carbon. Um, but actually you have to add more than that. <clears throat> so that's not possible. So the only way we think it can happen is if you have some sort of like hot bottom burning in an AGB star. It's my AGB connection. <laughs> and so that will cycle the whole envelope to low carbon. Um, and so next up, we're going to just explore that parameter pace with our merger models and, and see if we can get this carbon poorness and sodium richness and things happening. Okay, so just to summarize, um, so we focus on a small, very high quality sample, very well characterized using astro seismology combined with spectroscopic surveys for lots of abundances. Um, seismology is particularly helpful because it just disentangles the evolutionary state and the mass. Um, and we found that CDGs, at least the overluminous ones, are most likely low mass um, merger products from a red giant merging with a helium white dwarf. That's all. <laughs>
What is the mass of the white dwarf that's merging? Uh, so we end up, it's something like um, 0.4 at the moment. So you, we're still exploring that parameter of space. So then the question like is, 0.4. why would it merge? Sorry? So in, if you have a common envelope merger, which is what you're looking at, right? You're merging a white dwarf into a red giant. Yes. Then at point four, you don't merge. You eject the envelope. It's a, it's quite a massive companion for a RGB star that would be one, two solar masses. Yes. Right. So it's very hard to merge those. Okay. So dynamically, I don't think yeah. it's Oops. possible. Hi, great talk. Um, so how good are your Kepler frequencies. I ask because you can sometimes use individual frequency modeling to get the core mass of your star if you believe your model, your gyre models well enough, I guess. But is that a direction you're planning on going? Or are you sticking more towards like the modeling sort of side? Uh, we hope to go in both directions, but at the moment it's modeling. But yeah, it would be good to do the full sort of seismology on the models and the observations. Yeah, at the moment we're just using delta P. Okay. Just to distinguish between red clump and, and yeah, but it would be good to look at the details for sure. Okay. Thank you. You try to to explain the the carbon deficit with hot bottom burning, but this is for the luminous over luminous ones, right? Yes. Do you think the normal luminous ones will have like a similar reason of why they are carbon deficient? Yeah, good question. Yeah, in the we talk about the other ones in the paper. That that one we can't really say for sure if they're mergers or not. So we have a couple of different scenarios. Um, but if we look at the here, yeah, it's the blue ones. I'll just get rid of the duck stuff. Yeah, structurally they look fairly similar, but there's a there's a bit of bit of a hint. Uh, also, they're biased towards higher masses as well. So actually, we, we we don't have very strong evidence for the for the normal ones being um, normal luminosity ones being mergers, um, but they could be. So we just kind of need more information. Um, yeah, there's the blue ones here. So they're not fully. Some of them sort of lie in this normal range, but some of them are definitely a bit abnormal. So it looks like this. It could be another type of merger. But the a difficult thing to explain is why they're clumped at two different luminosities. And that's something we've been trying to work on. I had a third year student working on that this semester. And it's uh, tricky to do. How, because in principle, I can imagine that well, I was just, for, I was looking at the middle figure because how much mass do you need to retain from the envelope? But because couldn't it be that you eject part of the envelope, but you retain some of it? Because you don't need that much envelope to keep a giant structure. So you yes. just... Yeah, yeah. Um, all we know is the final mass. <laughs> That's what we've got here. So, yeah, as I said, we're going to play with the parameter space. Mm -hmm. But this model is something like a 0.2 helium core plus a 0.4 helium white dwarf. Mm -hmm. And that seems to do it. But it might be that anything that ends up with a 0.6 core or something like that, 0.5, uh, 0.6. So, so, sorry, can you repeat that? So this model was a? Uh, it's about a 0.2 helium... Core, giant core. Ah, okay. Th then you don't have a problem because you can reach that with a less massive helium white dwarf just by adding, increasing your initial core mass. Yes. Yeah. yeah if you just go close to the tip of the RGB, then you have a point for yeah. or point yeah. forty five, and then so you we only could, need to we could take it at point four five, something because, like that, and and add something. Small. Because the history here is completely meaningless. You only need the, the final structure is the only thing. To, exactly. The yeah. okay. Although you still have to end up. Uh, doing this to the structure. Yeah. So, and that's, it's, it's not certain that if this model seems to do it, mm -hmm. uh, it's not certain that if you have a more massive uh, centri uh, helium core and a very low mass helium white dwarf that you end up in the same place with the bulk properties. Yeah. Still have a, a question online. Uh, Zara, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, Simon. Thanks for the talk. So my question is, so you mentioned through population synthesis that the the giant and the helium white dwarf merger channel was actually very common, yet these yes. observed objects are very rare. Do you have any explanation as to why that could be? Could the models be wrong or is there something else happening? Um, 
I guess it depends what you call rare. Like in the, I mean, these merge objects should be rare, I imagine. <laughs> um, so I haven't looked at the details. It's, it is a 2007 who did the population synthesis. And yeah, I, I haven't tried to translate that directly from what they're predicting to what we're measuring with this particular type of merge object. So okay. yeah, I couldn't really say quantitatively, but qualitatively, I'd say the fact that they're rare is probably um, consistent. <laughs>